Hey, thanks for being here. Let's do some pod crashing. Episode number 197 is with Joel Larsgaard from the podcast, How to Money. I got to tell you that I'm so proud of you for putting this podcast together. And I know it's been going on for a while, but we are in a state in this country. I mean, the feds just raised the rates again. I mean, dude, people have got to discover this podcast, How to Money. Hey, Arrow, thanks for having me, man. And yeah, I agree. I think personal finance education is severely lacking in our country in our schools uh you know most of our parents didn't tell us anything about money so that's what that's what we try to do three days a week on the show is just help guide people like here's what's happening right now and also just here are the time tested uh things that you need to know so that you can handle your money well well i was i was shocked to learn that 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 they don't really teach finances in school anymore because i know that when i was in high school that was that was a major part of what we did i mean it was it was economics home economics and and that was one of the things that you know that they really enforced in our in our schools and stuff and 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 maybe maybe that's why that investing as early as i did in life is the reason why i'm enjoying what we're doing today i mean it's huge the earlier you get started it makes a big difference, right? And it's even just the little bits that you're investing when your salary is small in your early 20s pays massive dividends. You have to save something like five times the amount of money if you're starting investing at the age of 40 uh, than you do if you're starting investing closer to the age of 20. And so, yeah, that time matters, even if, and even if it's small amounts, even if it's 20 bucks a paycheck, it adds up in a big way and then it, and it just increases your ability to ha- to be flexible in life because you've got the money to back you up and instead of needing that next paycheck to make ends meet now it's like well i've got a lot more breathing room because i've been investing for seven eight nine ten twelve years and it provides just uh, a sense of security like i think you're just it, it's just a mental uh, relief a mental bomb but at the same time it's like no but i also have the money to back me up was it was it very scary for the financial world when so many people took an early retirement? I mean, they were doing it inside their 50s. Or is it, you know what, you, you, you've you paid your dues. Go ahead and enjoy some life because there's no real guarantee and the certainty here. Yeah, I mean, that's it, I feel like that's such an individual question, right? right. Because d- it depends on, on where you're at with your money and what your goals are and what your life looks like. I think sometimes what, one of the things we talk about on the show is we want people to enjoy what they do day to day. And uh, there's something called the FIRE movement where people want to get financially independent, they want to retire early. And sometimes it's a nose to the grindstone mentality. It's a, let me do a job that I don't really like for 10 to 12 years so that, and save just like 50, 60, 70% of my salary so that I can quit work and then never have to work again. I'm 35 or 40 and now the world is my oyster. And I think like I get where that mentality comes from, but I think uh, <laughs> in that pr- those prime years of your life to do something you don't like for that extended period of time, that 10 or 12 years is a long time. It, and so I want yeah. people to enjoy what they do day to day, even if that means making a little bit less money and putting off retirement a little bit longer. Um, but but yeah, so many of those, those things, like those are personal questions. Um, and if it means working 60 hours a week now so that you can eventually enjoy your life, I don't, I don't think that's a great strategy. It's not, it's not my favorite approach. Yeah, that stress level can get you really bad. Now all of a sudden, you know, what you, you, the soundtrack to your heart is like, well, I was doing this, I was doing this. We, all, we, always, we sound like Eeyore, you know, and it's like, but, but you know, I, one of the things that I've always wanted to know is that why is it so difficult to help people understand money? Is it because when we were growing up, it was like we, we went to the penny store, candy store and got everything. We just, we couldn't wait to spend it. <laughs> I think there's an element of, of people love spending money, right? Yeah. And there's the element of that it's not talked about and we kind of, we kind of shush everything. And uh, most, we, we, we sweep it under the rug. The only thing that we, most of us heard growing up, and the thing that I heard growing up was money arguments. I was never included in money conversations. Mm-hmm. And so that's like something I'm trying to change with, with my kids is, well, let's talk about delayed gratification. And you told me you want this thing. You want to spend your money on this. I get it. But what if we wait 48 hours before we make that purchase? And let's see if like we still want it because in the moment, of course you want it. But that's that's an impulse buy. And we're all subject to that, especially now it, with Instagram algorithms and stuff like that, serving us up stuff that we could want. Uh, or I, I just discovered last night, and I probably should have known this before, but on Instagram, there's literally a button you can push. And all you're doing is shopping. All you're doing is looking that's at stuff it. that Instagram thinks that you want to buy. And in that kind of environment, of course, we're going to be tempted to buy. It's it's terrible for our wallets and for just our our res- physical restraint. And so, uh, yeah, I think th- there's a there's a major problem with the fact that we haven't talked about money well 
as a culture or in our families. And so we it, were kind of in the dark about it. And you might be one of the rare people who felt like you were taught about it well in high school. But man, there's a there's an education problem. Um, and so we have to we just have to talk about that. And, and, it, and it's it's a long process to get good with money. It doesn't happen overnight. There's a lot to understand. The, the basics are really simple. Like, uh, you know, you could list them. Uh, one professor did this a while back on an index card. Right. The, mo- the most important things you need to know about money, you could write down on an index card. Yep. They're pretty simple. Yep. But then there's a lot of complexity behind it. And especially there's a lot of psychological complexity that needs to be kind of mined because we all grow up with these money scripts based on how we were raised. And if we're not in tune with those, we're likely to let those direct how we use and think about money for the rest of our lives. And so there's a lot of that exploration that needs to happen as we're kind of learning the nuts and bolts of how to handle money too. Well, you're right about that because I mean, money is like politics and religion. People just do not want to talk about it. It's like, I, I would love to sit down and talk with people and, and you know, and it's worked for us, but my wife has her money and I always say, that's your business. This is my business. We'll collaborate and bring businesses together, but we'll, we'll both be, and because we both come from broken families. So therefore we wanted to have that security of having our own background and our, and, and our own, you know, standing ground and stuff like that but it has worked very well for us to treat it like a business yeah and i think that's another thing too is different the different uh ways that you can kind of use money together as a couple or the ways that you divide money it 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 can look different from couple to couple uh, from individual to individual the some people like when let's talk about budgeting when when as an individual when you're budgeting let some people i have one friend she writes down everything in a physical ledger (laughs) my other my co-host he literally has a an excel spreadsheet for everything he does me i prefer to use mint i log in and i can see all my expenses in one place yep and other people uh, are helped best by uh, software like YNAB. You need a budget, which costs a little bit of money, but it has the most behavioral help uh, behind it. So it's kind of helping you make the right decisions so that you're eventually spending money that you made last month, not the money that you made this month. It's creating more of a gap for you and helping you save. But yeah, it, what it's going to look like, how it's going to shake out for individual folks is going to look different. And that's okay. But that's what we need to talk about too. It's like, hey, they depending on your personality type and uh, how good you are with numbers, you might need some sort of some sort of hyper specific budget or you might need more of a general budget because you're not the person who's going to literally type everything into Excel every month. Um, and I think that's the other thing too that needs to be talked about. It's like different strokes for different folks. Mm-hmm. That's okay, but we need to be thinking about it and making proactive decisions with our money because the reality is the more we're able to save and invest and think about our future with money, the more freedom we're buying for ourselves. You know, the listeners need to know the name of the podcast is called How to Money. And, and literally, I want, I want listeners to say that three or four times in a row because all of a sudden you're going to start getting the picture. Oh, my God, they're actually one of us. And, and so because so many times people will go, they'll buy stocks and mutual funds, they'll invest money. But then it's gone. The, inside their heart, they're going, well, I'm just giving my money away. It's not. Do- but yes, it is doing something for you. How to Money. And, and, and you guys are very down to earth with us about this kind of subject. Yeah, well, thanks. That's that's the goal because I think there has been kind of uh, throughout throughout history, <laughs> it, there's kind of like an I am the guru. Please tune in and listen to me and do what I say. Right. And we try to make it a two way conversation. There's there's a community around how to money. We've got a Facebook group and stuff like that. And there's a lot of wisdom out there. And uh, so we want to tap the hive mind as well. Like Matt and I, we've learned a lot over the years as we've kind of paid attention, read about the subject and done a lot of different sort of uh, in- investing and saving savings tactics and we want to share those with our with our community but the reality is we're we're not the smartest guys in the world we're not even usually the smartest guys in the room so we're doing our best to share the knowledge that we've got and have a good time doing it and, and we want to make it approachable because that is a big part of the problem is that so much financial advice is is shaming it's unapproachable it's mm-hmm. why did you buy the avocado toast you idiots and why aren't you thinking about your future and when you when you talk to people like that they tune you out they move on and they just continue being bad with their money so the approach i think matters and yeah our our approach is one of like shepherding people along like hey look we're all in this together how do we get good with our money uh, not just as individuals, but as a community. Yeah, because, I mean, I mean, you know, on one side of, of, of the world, you know, Dave Ramsey is saying, hurry up and pay off your house, whereas my financial advisor is saying, don't do that because that's a solid line of credit for you. What happens if something goes wrong? What's your credit going to be? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, d don't want to get in <laughs> into a fight with the great Dave, but man, yeah, we disagree on some stuff. Like, I, I think credit cards can be used well as a tool to build credit, yep. to get a, uh, gain extra rewards. We just talked with uh, Brian Kelly, the points guy, about that on our podcast. So if you want to travel for free or, uh, you know, or very little money, like uh, travel rewards points are awesome. Or when you're talking about paying down uh, your your home mortgage, we just, we just had an episode about the strategic use of debt and the reality is in an era of 9% inflation, almost 9% inflation, having a mortgage at 3% or even lower, like paying that off more quickly when there are other goals you could more easily easily achieve, when you could be investing more of your money in a down market. Uh, I, I prefer to point people in that direction. Most people point it, to point most people in that direction because for, for a lot of folks, that is gonna be in their long-term best interest. Yeah. And it's not that, I get it, there's a mental weight to debt for some people and they're just like, I gotta be done with this. I gotta get it off my back. I hate debt. And so if that's, again, different strokes for different folks, if that's your personality bent, then paying off your mortgage more quickly might make most sense for you as an individual. But for most folks, if, if it means being able to fund, if it means you're gonna spend the money <laughs> that you would have paid toward the mortgage, that's a different story. Yeah. But if it means you're going to invest the money and start sticking it in the in your side of your 401k, inside of your Roth IRA, instead of paying down your mortgage, we would say, that's a better option. Yeah. We, we keep hearing in these radio and television commercials, and we also hear on the shows and stuff like that about options, 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 you know, and, and to me, options are choices, but it really seems like a lot of people are wasting their options. How can we refocus that? Oh, man. So you mean just like people are wasting opportunity out there? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah. Be because, you know, people just they, it, it's it's almost like they're, they're, they're waiting for life to catch up to them when in reality we should be making life. Yeah. I mean, I think that there's there's this especially right now in our culture, there's this kind of belief that everything around you is like that you have been put in a place and you there's not much you can do about it. I think there is a certain amount of, of, of victim culture that we have going on in the United States. But the reality is we are all in the driver's seat of our own life. We just don't see ourselves that way most of the time. We see life happening to us as opposed to us happening to life. And so I think that's a mindset shift that needs to happen, especially when we're talking about getting your money together and, and getting better with your money. And so you have to believe that there is that you have agency and that you can make a different choice and that that can impact your future. And if you don't believe that, then it's going to be really hard to actually make positive changes with your money. You're probably going to be resigned to continuing to do things the way you've been doing them. So, yeah, I do think it's a really important part of it. Changing your mindset. Realize that we, we did a, uh, an episode a while back about grit. And Angela Duckworth is a psychology professor, and she talks about how grit is literally like the number one thing that determines how far people go in life. And I think that's true. I think there's a lot said to that. And I think there are ways that you can build up grit in your life, become a grittier person who uh, slogs through hardship, who takes those financial setbacks that happen, but you continue to, to press ahead. But there's a way to do that. And so I think that's really, that's really important is that you have to kind of shift that mindset, not realizing that, yeah, bad things happen. Yeah, emergencies happen. That's why you got that emergency fund. But you can continue pressing ahead and making progress despite setbacks that, that might occur and despite maybe ways in which the starting, like you, you started behind other people, like you didn't have the same advantages. But um, there was a recent study too about second generation immigrants and the New York Times had a great article about this. Second generation immigrants may, are, are uh, the most financially successful Americans. And so uh, whether we're talking, no matter what country they come from, we, when you look at the data, there's something about the hunger and the dedication and the grit that second generation immigrants mm -hmm. um, uh, have. And so we could all stand, stand to learn from them and add some more of those elements of how they approach life into our own. That boy, you bring up some memories in my heart right there, buddy, because I mean, that's one of those things. I mean, I came from an extremely poor family and then people always ask me, you know, why do I do this? Why do I do this? I said, because I don't want to go back there. And, and yeah. you're, you're right. I mean, it, because it, it, you know, I find my focus and, and, and then part of that focus is knowing where I don't want to grow. The, the name mm -hmm. of the podcast is How to Money. Um, we, we live in this age right now where it seems like, you know, we're, we've got this shadow, this recession shadow hanging over our head. And, and then we hear that the stock market has fallen 1,000 points. My God. I mean, it's, it's like every time we take a step, we don't want to, you know, it's like, I got to go spend some money because I got to feel good. Mm. 
Oh yeah, no, that's a real problem, right? It's it's when you when you pay too much attention to the news, mm -hmm. you're liable to take sh make short term moves based on emotion, and that's one of the things we talk about is just tuning out the news. Like, don't pay as much attention because uh, we we want to be long term investors. We think it's important to to invest for not just a year or two from now, but for ten or twenty years from now. And if you have that mentality. Who cares that the stock market dropped four percent in one day last week? Like it doesn't matter to you. It's and in fact, it actually represents potentially uh, more of a buying opportunity. Mm -hmm. So instead of letting it get you down and be like, "Oh, that derailed my progress," as you're tracking your progress, uh, as you continue to invest, you're gonna see, <laughs> you're gonna see that uh, your net worth is growing over the years. Even if in a given month or year your net worth is is down somewhat, the continued uh, continuing to do the right things over and over and over, which means contributing a certain percentage of your paycheck to your 401k, getting that company match, setting aside money in a Roth IRA, right, for your future and investing in something super simple, easy to understand, like a total stock market fund or an S&P 500 fund. If you're doing that with regularity, success is going to happen to you. <laughs> it's based on those little moves that you make. And who cares, again, that the narrative is Oh, doom and gloom, or that the stock market's doing this or that, and it's down 18% over the uh, it, so far this year, and we're on the track for the worst year on record. Like, these are good things actually for long-term investors. You just have, kind of have to reframe it. Talk about a mental shift. We need a mental shift in the way we think about these headlines, and and we we can honestly probably all stand to pay attention to them a little bit less than we do. What about the, the the housing situation that we've got right now? Where where in my neighborhood houses are selling astronomically high. I mean, I mean, first of all, is that not going to affect our taxes? And and second of all, I mean, how can these new how can we get new home buyers to even invest if they can't afford? Yeah, no, housing affordability is a real problem, but I do think that we're in for a shift on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so the the economy goes through cycles. And when you talk, think about how cheap homes were in 2009, 10, and 11, and how low interest rates were, like that, you know, that, that was a once in a lifetime sort of thing. But uh, we've seen home prices climb as rates have been kind of kept artificially low. But now that rates are, are climbing, I think we're going to start to see a correction, which, which is a good thing for first time home buyers or for, for people out there who want to own a home and haven't been able to. So um, yeah, that, that's something to pay attention to. But you're right too, you, you mentioned, taxes as uh, your home value goes up that's something to pay attention to if you live in a state where the property taxes are high and you can challenge that assessment that's something that you should look into also because you might be paying extra hundreds or more dollars every single year to your local state government for property taxes when you could easily challenge those and get them reduced and you can do it yourself for free you can hire a lawyer typically to do that but that's something that you as a consumer as an individual can do you can challenge that tax assessment and you can you can get a lot of that money call, call that, a lot of that money back into your life another thing that we're facing and and thank god for our governor here in north carolina for for putting a halt to it but it seems like these states want to uh, collect some taxes when it comes to getting the the loan forgiveness and it's like oh my god they, you're, it just, it just amazes me how if anybody gets any money from anything the government's got to put their fingers in it yeah that's a political problem right yeah. um, but it's true it's something that people need to be prepared for if you were uh if you did have some of your student loan debt forgiven somewhere between 10 maybe even up to twenty thousand dollars depending on whether or not you had a pell grant then it, it's it's really it's possible that you might owe state income tax depending on where you live something like eight to 10 states are actively considering sending bills for people. So you might have a higher state tax bill due this coming year. Mm -hmm. Granted, you still come out ahead, right? If you're forgiven, let's say $10,000 in student loan debt, but you have a $400 tax bill, you came out ahead. But uh, but you still need to be prepared for that because that's money coming out of your pocket. And, and also talking about student loans, People need to be prepared for those payments to start again come January. A lot of people, it's been out of sight, out of mind for three years. And so people aren't ready for those payments to resume. And they need to be ready now. They need to start carving that out in their budgets right now yep. so that come January, they're in a position to pay them. See, and that's every reason why people need to be attached to this podcast. I mean, it's so simple to listen to while you're in the car, while you're at work and stuff like that. And you guys are so down to earth real. And man, you and Matt, I, I'm just so proud of you guys for this, for this podcast, How to Money. Thanks, Arrow. I appreciate it, man. Thanks so much for having me on. Well, please come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you, dude. Sure. Thanks. I'll be back anytime you want.